Hello, my name is Margaret Garcia. Thank you for joining us here today at uh, Plaza de la Raza. Today we're going to talk about the portrait, the portrait from life. You have the ability to take a photograph and project it and make a pencil drawing and make what they call a cartoon and be able to fill that in and make uh, an exact duplicate of your photograph. This is not that. This is painting from life and having a connection or an interaction with your model. The reason you want to do that or the reason you, you might choose to do that is because it isn't just about having a visual identical reiteration of uh, that photograph. If you paint a photograph of a person, you're still painting a photograph. But when you sit with your subject and you sit with your model, you have an exchange. And that exchange might be a conversation. That, might, that exchange might be some good music or a glass of wine. Or you may find that every time you smile at your subject, they smile back. It is about this connection that you develop with your subject. It has to do with the way you see them as part of your community and what you reflect about that. Sometimes when you see dignity, it's because you have dignity. And so when you see your subject, you, you might be able to reflect on that. And you get to spend time with them in this exchange in a time when it's very difficult to spend time with anybody. So let's start. Okay, so we're going to do two kinds of portraits today. I'm going to do an egg to begin with. Now this is kind of big. As you see my subject here, she's not that big, but it doesn't matter. We're going to start with an egg. Now in the center of that egg, is where traditionally the eyebrows are, are uh, placed, or the brow ridge. And then you have ears here. Okay, now I'm not even bothering to look at her at this point because I'm more interested in giving you some anatomical uh, tools with which to, to draw. That's why I'm not really reflecting on her and she hasn't even taken her mask off. This is where the eyebrows are. This is where the eyes are. And I, I've done it kind of thin because it's kind of almost like a, a watercolor at this point. I am not even looking at her at this point. And the reason I'm not is because I want to explain to you that this is just your sort of basic anatomy. You know, um, this is the I'm going to show you, but her ear comes across her brow. Most of us, that's kind of where it is. Sometimes it's a little high. But when you do the mouth through the center of the eyes, you're going to find, okay, I'm going to ask you to take your mask off briefly. Hold on. I need to put my mask on. Okay, what you're going to notice when you paint your subject is that the corner of the mouth is going directly through the center of the eyes. The corner of the mouth goes directly through the center of the eyes. And sometimes it looks like the mouth is a lot smaller because the lips are usually in here. Now, this is usually where the forehead starts. And you have, I'm going to ask you to take your mask off. So if you look at the tear ducts, you're going to find where your nostrils are. OK, this is a very basic kind of map that you have that you can basically paint most people from. Unless their anatomy is just a little off people. Sometimes their eyes are, are not, their face is not as symmetrical. Some people are very symmetrical, some people are not. There's always a difference. But this is sort of your basic map where you can kind of find where people are at. 
And, and if there is a difference, you'll be able to see it because you know that there's a, a map uh, to go with it. Her neckline is just a little bit off of her, her ears. It's not like this. Some people do things and then they do a cartoon and that's like a cartoon. We're not doing a cartoon here today. And you don't have to worry about these lines because I'm making them so thin I'm going to be able to paint over them so I'm not worried about them. There is a, a little muscle that goes here. Everybody has that little muscle. And then she has, you know, a shirt. Now, I haven't really been looking at her so much because I, what I'm interested in conveying here to you today is a structure that exists within almost all human beings. Um, you know, unless a person is really, you know, they have a birth defect or something's different about them. But uh, that's usually the, the sort of structure that most people have. Um, you don't have to worry about these lines, you know, like you're going, oh, but I want to do it without the lines. The thing is to learn where those lines are so that when you go to do your, your face over it, you're going to find that it's a lot easier to say, okay, the eye is here, the nose is here, the lips are here, the ears are there, and not spend all your time trying to figure out if you've got enough distance. If you're projecting your image and you're using a photograph, you don't have to worry about that because it projects it exactly where you want it. But when you're working from life, you need a little bit of a road map in order to be able to figure out exactly where those things are. Now, this is oil paint. It's not acrylic. And what's nice for me with oil is that oil paint is malleable. Now, I like to paint on canvases that have a lot of paint on them. And we're, and we're not doing that here today because I want to be able to show you on a white surface how you can shape that oil paint. Because the oil paint, it's like butter, it's like grease. You can change things. Now, you have the ability to use your thinner almost like uh, an eraser. And um, you pick up your thinner and you can wipe it out. You can use your brush or you can use your rag and wipe off the surface. And that's the benefit of using oil because you have more malleability and you have the ability to shape your, your lines the way you want them so that they cover the way you need them. What we're doing right now is we're creating an underpainting and it is the structure of your painting. Once you have the structure, you can spend all your time. Um, you can spend all your time with the fun part of it. You don't have to worry about these lines that you you put on there to measure. Those were there to help you figure out where things are are at, and that's why I like the oil paint. Now, usually the top lip on people tends to be dark because it's in shadow and you get a little shadow under the bottom lip. So, you know, I've given you my proportions and I haven't really been looking at my friend Amy here. So now I'm going to go to my subject and I'm going to look at her and reflect as I paint so that it looks more like her, right? Before, all I was trying to do was give you a shape so that um, you knew where I was going with it. Now I'm going to just paint for a while.
Now this is a, a bit of an underpainting and I have the flexibility with oil to make any corrections I need. Right now this is sort of like my demarcation, you know, I, I, I might exaggerate an expression or two if I really like that. Um, I might paint her, if I wanted to paint her in flesh tones I have that option. But me being me, and because there is such a thing called artistic freedom, and you have the freedom to paint your friend, your person, whoever you're painting, in whatever color you feel that person gives you a feeling of. If you want to paint them all blue, you can paint them all blue. If you want to paint them green, you can paint them green. But that's okay. It's about you expressing the way you feel about that person and that moment and that feeling. So right now I'm building a sort of a cartoon of my friend in this moment. And it's okay if, if I make a, if I have something that I need to correct or if I feel that it's, you know, not exactly the way I want it, that's fine. With purple as an underpainting, you have the freedom and the ability to bring that back to flesh tones or, or, or exaggerate the color and be as crazy as you want. If you want to do a fauve painting or if you want to do a painting that, that is a little more realistic, you do that through layers of paint. Now, if I picked up a uh, yellow ochre, I suppose that would be a little closer because that's sort of an earth tone. But I don't use a lot of yellow ochre. I might use yellow itself and shape it from that point on. At, at this point, this painting is ready for me to just let it sit for a few minutes. It gives me time to get up, walk across the room, and, and give it a look and ask myself, is it ready for the color? At this point, it would be ready for the color, but I'm going to let the, the underpainting of the purple dry just a little bit so that when I come back with some more paint, it doesn't just smear. I need it to set just a tiny bit, and that just takes like a few minutes. So right now, while we're taking a little break from uh, painting because I'm letting the paint set a little bit. You can continue painting. It, it, there's no problem with that. The, the paint right now is dry to touch. If I touch it, you get a little bit of oil paint on your hand, but it doesn't smear. And I'm letting it set a little bit and I'm going to take the time to show you a, a few other little tricks and tips. So you may be at home with a child right now, and you may say to yourself, I want to do Junior's portrait, or your child's portrait, whoever. And so, you know, you make an egg, and here's your egg again. Now, you can say to yourself, you, you've done their portrait, and you say, gee, it looks like them, except they look like they're 40 years old or they look a little older than you expect. And that's because the shape of the head is different from that of an adult. You know, in an adult, you start in the center. With a child, you start down here because the cranium is still growing. And so what you do on a child is you lower the level the eye level or the bra level is a little lower than it would be if you were doing an adult. And what's happening sometimes is that there's a tendency to uh, elongate the face and make this a little longer. If, if you're painting or drawing a child, what you have to be aware of is where the head's at. And what you need to do sometimes is to lower the, the, the point of uh, the eye level. Um, 
the same is true with the lines. You have to look at where is the corner of the mouth and where is the center of the eye. And you will find that it's basically the same. What changes sometimes is where the lips are. And so if you're having problems painting your child, it could be that you're elongating the face too much. And so, you know, they don't have um, such a long face. Their, their face is a little rounder. Now, when you paint someone's face, there is a direct relationship to the proportion of your hand as to your face. Their hand can cover the face, the facial area. So you don't, you don't want to make the hands any, any bigger than that or the face any smaller than that. You want to stay within those ratios. Now, a child doesn't have a big neck. You're going to find that their, their, their neck line is, you know, something like that. And, and their heads are a little bigger because their jaws are still developing. And so the bottom half of the face is not as big as it would be for an adult. And if you want the portrait that you did of your child, you have to be aware of the ratios between the center of the face. So that looks more like a child just because I lowered the level of the eye or the, the, the level of the eye. Don't forget to put in the ears. The ears are in direct relationship to the brow and to the end of the nose. So that's my advice. Sometimes kids start developing these little jowls right there, and that makes them a little more baby-like. Now, I don't have a child here, so we're going to go back to painting Amy. My brush has a little bit of thinner in it, and I can, if I want to, feather out all of these lines and soften them if that's what I want to do, if I'm trying to, to if I'm really concerned about the shapes and I, I want to use this sort of eraser-like of effect so that none of the lines uh, look too harsh. If I want to do that, I can do that. But at this point, it's not even that important because uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a little bit of liquid. Um, it's a medium. It's a painting medium. There's many different kinds of mediums. I tend to use this Winsor Newton liquid. In my last lesson, I gave you a, a little bit of a, a color lesson, and I talked about opposites and color and what have you. And I'm a bit of a colorist. I enjoy bright, vibrant color. I can paint her in green if I want. I can paint her in orange or yellow or any of those. But if I'm, if I'm trying to come closer to a skin tone or a color tone, and I have purple on here, then what I'm probably going to do is put down a little bit of cadmium yellow deep. And you're going to see what happens is that you get a color that's almost, you know, depending on how much yellow you put out or how much purple you have on there, the color that you're going to come up with is close to ochre. And if you're trying to uh, work or if you're interested in working in different um, I want to say layers of luminosity, you can see that it basically turns kind of um, ochre like. And um, not, not that far from where I want. Now, at this point, if I wanted to, and I said, oh, you know, I don't like where I put her ear, I'm going to erase it. That's all you have to do. So you don't have to worry about mistakes at this point because you can say to yourself, well, wait a minute, let me put that back in. Or, you know, her ears stick out more or they don't stick out so much or they do whatever they do. Or, you know, I have 
little earring there or something like that. You can emphasize certain things that you didn't emphasize the first time. When you look at someone and you paint their portrait, you might not always see everything the first time. Sometimes it's visiting and revisiting. And if you have a really animated conversation with that person, you might find that, you know, the whole thing changes because of that conversation. And that is really the best because it, the portrait becomes imbued with the experience of that moment. And that's why I enjoy that. I'm going to lay a, a little bit of a background color so that I can pull her away from the background color. It may not be my final color, but I'm going to let it play on the background. My goal on the first layer of paint is often just to make sure that I can cover the entire canvas and make sure that all of the white is gone. Because I, I, I don't want to see a white panel. I want that gone. And I want to be able to, to play with my colors and, and emphasize certain things over others. And when I've blocked out all that white paint or all that white surface, it lets me see my colors a little more than normal. If you focus just on one part of your image and you don't do everything sort of like one layer over the whole thing, sometimes you find that there isn't a balance of color. But I'm focused on her face and in order for me to really focus on her face, I want the background to kind of push back and die back. So I'm filling that out now. In order to learn how to create luminosity and layers and understand the value of that particular color, you have to give up white long enough to learn it and long enough to learn what that kind of blue is going to give you when it's transparent on, on your panel. If you don't do that, it isn't that you can't learn it, it's that it's going to take you a little longer to learn it. I do use white paint, but I tend to save the white for almost the last layer so that I can layer these different colors and create a little bit more of a glow. And so the paint is not flat. You see blue, but it's not a flat blue. There's other things that come through there. So her hair has a lot of white in it, but I am layering this dark purple there for now because when I get to putting the white there, I'm going to want some dark on which to contrast it. And that's why I'm, I'm not going for white right away. Now, because I've been painting for 40 some odd years, it doesn't take me as long to get there as it would somebody else. But when you're first learning, you have to be able to back up enough and give yourself enough time to learn what that color is going to do for you. Usually at this point is when I start shaping the face a little more. Now, you know, I started this painting today. So there's still, if I wanted to, I could take thinner and erase any part I wanted to. If I wanted to move her nose up or move her mouth down or say, you know, hey, I didn't get it in the right place. That's okay because you know what? I have, you know, a good two hours to be able to, to make those changes. And as it is, I think I've decided that what I want to do, just to, as um, sort of a demonstration, 
is show you that. Her mouth is a little higher. She has a little more upper lip than I've given her. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower that. Now you wouldn't be able to do this with acrylic as easily. So what I'm doing is I'm just basically erasing. And I'm doing this to demonstrate to you that you can move things. They're more malleable for a longer period of time. Now, the paint here is a little wet. So what I do, because I want to work on that area, but it's a little wet, so I just give it a break. Just stop painting there long enough Go to some other area of the portrait that needs a little more help and a little more work and focus on that and give it a few minutes to kind of hold the canvas or hold the panel long enough so you don't have to keep working it and keep working it and trying to fix it. Sometimes you have to let it breathe. Sometimes you have to just sort of move on until you've got it where you want it. You know, you're shaping it. And that's the thing about oil paint is that you're able to shape things. No, they don't dry fast. People think, oh, well, if it dries fast, I can paint over it. Yeah, but you can only do that to a certain extent before you, you, you run out of steam and then you won't be able to fix that. Amy Inoue, who is a gallerist. She has a gallery called Future Gallery, and, 
and sometimes referred to as Chicken Boy. And she was kind enough to come in and social distance with me and allow me to do this portrait. During the pandemic, it's been very difficult to do portraits of people because uh, we're not uh, sitting with each other and we're not talking to each other. And the, the other thing is that it, it makes it very difficult to invite people in to sit. Um, however, there are people who are at home with their, with their parents, with their kids, with their spouses, and they want to paint and they want to do a portrait. So I'm hoping that this lesson encourages you, helps you uh, to move forward with that and not be intimidated by the paint or the canvas. Um, how did it feel to sit for your portrait today? It's, um, it's kind of meditative for the sitter um, because you know, you're sort of looking at, at, you find a spot and you just look at that. You're not typically you know, seeing the artist working, you're just kind of letting them do their thing and letting them concentrate on the work mm -hmm. and you're just trying to sort of be still. Right. But it's a really nice, um, you know, you don't do that often. No. So I kind of enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.